So welcome to another Drug Chug episode, and today we'll talk about anoxaparin and how it works, plus some pharmacology. So let's get right into it. Here's a quick breakdown of everything in this video. There are timestamps down below, and at the very end we'll have a short quiz to see what we retained. So what exactly is anoxaparin? Let's have a quick overview. Well, anoxaparin is also known as Lovenox, and I do want to mention another drug here called Daltaparin, which is brand name Fragmin. And both of these drugs do the same thing. Now, I do want to note that anoxaparin is more common. You will see this more often in hospitals. And both of these drugs are considered low molecular weight heparin, and it's abbreviated as LMWH. And what this does is prevent blood clots. So these are anticoagulants. So both of these drugs are used to stop or prevent blood clots from forming. Some things I want to highlight, both of them are weight-based dosing, so it depends on how heavy the patient is, and they're both sub-Q injections. So we said they were both a low molecular weight heparin, and what you need to know is that heparin is a natural anticoagulant that our body already has. So there's heparin floating around endogenously to help prevent blood clots on a regular basis in a regular patient. So these drugs are based off the natural heparin that we already have. And all they did was they took heparin and they made the molecule shorter, hence low molecular weight heparin. Now that we know a little bit more about anoxaparin, we could talk about how it actually helps prevent blood clots. And to know that, we need to learn about the clotting cascade. Now, if you're enrolled in the drug chug course, we talked about it in the last video, but here's a quick overview. So we have the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway of the clotting cascade. Basically, both sides have different clotting factors, and they meet at the middle at 10, and then 2, and then lastly at one, which is fibrin, which is our end product. And then we also talked about how blood clots are actually formed and that you need both platelets and that fibrin that came from the clotting cascade. This clotting cascade is part of our homeostasis, meaning it's always turning on and off whenever it needs to. So for the clotting cascade to turn off, naturally we have something called antithrombin 3 that's also floating around in our blood. And antithrombin 3's job is to block clotting factor 2, also known as thrombin, and clotting factor 10 to prevent making fibrin, which is part of a blood clot. So everything we talked about is naturally occurring in the body day to day. So when we add a drug like anoxaparin and daltaparin, the way it works is that it stimulates antithrombin 3 to work more. And if antithrombin 3 works more, we're blocking more and more thrombin and clotting factor 10. If we block thrombin and clotting factor 10, we don't produce fibrin. And remember, fibrin is needed to make a blood clot because we said fibrin with platelets make blood clots. One cool little note here is in the word anoxaparin, you see the letters XA, and that basically stands for activated factor 10, which is one of the main clotting factors that it blocks. Now that we have a better understanding of how it works, let's talk about when we actually use anoxaparin. So the first one would be if a patient has had or is at risk of having a deep vein thrombosis. And that's a blood clot in the deep veins, usually in the leg. And there are two ways we look at this. We either give the patient a prophylactic dose, meaning that they don't have a blood clot yet, but they're at a high risk of developing one. And some reasons for this would be if they've had abdominal surgery, a hip replacement, or a knee replacement, or an acute DVT anoxaparin dose, meaning they already have one, they currently have a blood clot, and we need to treat it as soon as possible. 
And that makes sense because we learned that anoxaparin is an anticoagulant. It's supposed to get rid of blood clots and prevent new ones from forming. We could also see it being used if a patient has had a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, or unstable angina, which is severe chest pain. And here we would give it as a prophylaxis again because we don't want to have something called ischemic complications, which basically means that blood isn't flowing to the tissues. And since anoxaparin is an anticoagulant, we're thinning the blood technically to allow blood to flow more easily to those areas. And one unique use is actually with the use of warfarin. And earlier in the previous video, we talked about how warfarin is a blood thinner. It's also an anticoagulant. But the issue we saw with warfarin is that it took five days for it to work. There was a delayed onset. So what we do when a patient is newly starting warfarin for the first time is we'll dose out five days of anoxaparin with the use of warfarin. So that way, by the time the warfarin works, the anoxaparin has been working. All right, so a lot of these concepts are covered, so we're almost done. We just need to talk about the dosing and adjustment for anoxaparin and daltaparin. Anytime you dose these drugs, there are two things you always have to remember, weight-based and creatinine clearance. So when we dose these drugs, we also have to know if it's the prophylactic dose or the treatment dose, kind of like how we talked about earlier. Let's start with anoxaparin. So for the prophylactic dose, it's either a 40 milligram subcutaneous shot every day, or you could do a 30 milligram subcutaneous shot twice a day. But if their creatinine clearance is less than 30, meaning that their kidney function isn't too good, we could only give them 30 milligrams subcutaneously every day. Well, what if they already have a DVT and we want to treat the DVT? Then the dosing changes. So for treatment, we could do one milligram per kilogram twice a day, or one and a half milligram per kilogram every day. But again, if their creatinine clearance is less than 30, we have to reduce the dose to only one milligram per kilogram every day. Now, Daltaparin has a similar story. For prophylaxis, we could either do 2,500 units daily or 5,000 units daily. For treatment, it goes back to weight-based. We either give them 100 units per kilogram twice a day or 200 units per kilogram every day. And again, if their creatinine clearance is less than 30, we need to monitor these patients more closely. One test we could monitor is something called the anti-factor 10A levels to let us know if we need to adjust the dosing. So let's talk about some of the clinical pearls and side effects we see with anoxaparin. The first one would be something called thrombocytopenia, which just means a very low platelet count. And typically a normal range is anywhere from 150 to 450,000 platelets per microliter. A serious complication can be something called HIT, sometimes referred to as HAT, and this is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and it can be very severe. Essentially, it's an autoimmune reaction where the body's immune system starts attacking the platelets. This is more common with actual heparin. There's a lower chance with these low molecular weight heparins, but nonetheless, it's something that has to be monitored. The second thing here is bleeding risk, and we know all our anticoagulants have the risk for bleeding because if we give them too much, then we could push them to the bleeding side. And we also want to look at lab monitoring. So anoxaparin and daltaparin don't refer to INR like our warfarin did, but we should still look at the platelet counts. We definitely need to look at renal function because both these drugs are eliminated through the kidney. And we can check the anti-factor 10A levels to see if we need to do any dose adjustments. So when injecting, we want to inject in the sides of the abdomen, so kind of like the love handle area. We want to stay away from the belly button when we put the needle in. 
Also remember it's a sub Q injection. So here we would pinch gently, have the needle at a 90 degree angle and go straight in. And the needle is super short because again, we're not trying to reach the muscle. We're just trying to reach the subcutaneous layer. And it's good to try and remember that anoxaparin is okay to be used in pregnancy. All right, so that was a lot, but that's everything you need to know. So let's have a quick summary and then take a short quiz. We talked about anoxaparin, the brand name is Lovenox, and daltaparin, the brand name Fragmin. Out of the two, anoxaparin is more common. And then we talked about heparin versus low molecular weight heparin, and we said how these are low molecular weight heparins because they have a smaller molecule size. And then we said that these are anticoagulants, meaning they stop or prevent blood clots. And the way they did this was they enhanced our peptide antithrombin-3. And antithrombin-3 stops thrombin, which was clotting factor 2, and clotting factor 10. And then we talked about the different types of dosing. We have prophylactic dosing versus treatment dosing. We know we have to take the patient's weight and kidney function into account. And then we talked about why we use these medications. Anything from a deep vein thrombosis to a MI, we use it for warfarin bridging. And then we covered key points like it's a subcutaneous injection and it's okay in pregnancy. So with that, let's take the short quiz to see what we retained. Question one, what class of drug is anoxaparin? Question two, anoxaparin works with which of the following to promote anticoagulation? Question three, at which creatinine clearance level do we adjust dosing for anoxaparin? Question four, what type of injection is anoxaparin and deltaparin?